What's happening, people? It's your girl, Mina. Welcome back to my channel. You already know what it is. First and foremost, let me actually check. I didn't even, I didn't do my pre-audio checks, but my audio is working. Big up to everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful Wednesday. I was about to say Tuesday. I had to quickly look at my calendar here. Uh, I hope you're having a wonderful Wednesday wherever you guys are, man. You guys know what it is. I know I've been a bit inconsistent, but guys, I'm just, I'm trying to get back into the groove, groove of things after Ramadan. Um, so please bear with me. Please forgive me. But we're trying to bring you a lot of the content. You already know what it is. And of course, it's been a few days since my last stream. So there's been a bit of Manchester United talk, Manchester United, I would say news so we're going to obviously talk about it and as always i want to hear everyone's views um was watching champions league yesterday we'll be watching champions league today so let me know uh the pinned poll uh in the chat what would you prefer would you prefer watch along for today's two games or uh would you prefer uh, just to do a post-match reaction after the game um just let me know i feel like with watch alongs guys i i, I love doing watch alongs I, I really enjoy it but like watching two games at the same time was difficult for me yesterday uh doing it on stream is even more difficult but and also i feel like the watch alongs are a bit saturated uh in the in the content world i think i know for example like there's like seven different people i'm subscribed to right now who are doing watch alongs this evening um but yeah let me know in the in in, in the uh in the poll uh, let me oh damn watch alongs are winning right now let me know in the poll of course what you guys would prefer, um, an opportunity to hate on Arsenal, an opportunity to uh, hate on City. Don't mind if I do. Don't mind if I do. Big up to everyone. Be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. If you want to join the membership club, you can. It's the pinned comment in the chat. You get your badges, you get your emojis, you get your custom member content as well. And of course, you get to support the growth of the channel. Like I said, I know in the header of my YouTube, uh, the banner of my YouTube channel, it says daily streams. I lied. I've actually lied. I saw it today and I was like, oh my God, I really need to do better. So the daily streams are coming. I just need to figure out a time that is best for myself and for the viewers, because of course, I know there's some people that watch like in, in like maybe Far East Asia or in America, etc. Um, so time zones, you know, it's not it's not always ideal. It's not always ideal. If you're in Europe and Africa, you're chilling because the time zones are relatively similar. So I just need to figure out a time that works every day, maybe 12 p.m. every day, UK time. I don't know if that would work. Um, but I need to be more consistent with the, the regular st regular streams. I'm talking about daily streams, whether it's not just Manchester United stuff, but even like non-Manchester United content, which I don't know if a lot of you guys actually want to see. Um, I know some of you guys are probably United fans and then some of you guys are probably not. So I just need to plan it all out, decide all of that. And I'm in the process of kind of switching up the HQ again. It's only been a couple of months, but I'm switching it up as well. Um, and then it's a busy couple of months because, you know, it's the, pr practically the end of the season soon, the end of the women's season, um, FA Cup, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so there's just a lot of things for me to kind of plan for. But I promise you lot, I will be consistent daily streams, at least one stream a day uh, talking about Manchester United stuff and then maybe other streams of non-Manchester United stuff. So the Arsenals, the Liverpools, the Cities, the Chelsea's, um, all of that kind of stuff. You guys know what it is. Now, yesterday was the first of the two days of Champions League football and Jadon Sancho, Marcel Sabitza, one current, one ex-Manchester United player, made it through to the semi-finals of the UEFA Champions League. So congratulations to them. That was a ridiculous game. I was watching both games. I had the PSG game on the TV and I had the Dortmund game on my tablet. And like at one point I had to switch it around because the Dortmund game was the most, the more entertaining game out of the two of them. Uh, the PSG game was literally just PSG all over Barca uh, after their red card. Congratulations to them. Congratulations to Dortmund. I think a lot of people have kind of wrote Dortmund off. Um, one thing I don't like, though, is every time Jadon Sancho does something well, it's like, oh, but he wasn't good enough for United. I saw people saying, oh, look at Marcel Sabitzer, but he wasn't good enough for United, or we were playing him at DM, or, or whatever. Let them flourish. Why does everything have to come back to, oh, woe is United look at united this that we know we know what the structure is at united but let's not let's not fool ourselves and act like, act like for example jaden sancho um was 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 I was going to say an angel. He, he is. I don't want to go far to say he's not an angel but don't act like he never did anything wrong to lead to the situation that is at hand right now between him and manchester united let's not let's not do that i'm happy for jaden sancho and i said this 
back in January when he was going out on loan, I said, if he goes out on loan, I want him to do well. Not because it will increase the value for Manchester United. I said I wanted him to do well because I just want to see him play football with a smile on his face. And that's applicable to anyone um, that may have been going through a difficult time during their football career. I just wanted to see him play football and be happy. That's it. And, you know, I, I can look at people like, for example, like Deli Ali when he was going through difficulties. I just wanted him to play football with a smile on his face again. And when a player is enjoying playing football, you know, then you know that you might get a lot more out of them. And Jaden Sancho, throughout the campaign, since he returned back, he's been doing good. I'm not going to lie. He's been doing good at Dortmund. I don't think he was the exclusive trigger for their comeback yesterday but he had a decent performance I wouldn't say he was an amazing like he had a 10 out, he dropped out a 10 out of 10 performance but he had a good performance on the Champions League stage which he hasn't really had the opportunity to do at Manchester United now whether he comes back or not to United it's funny Dal just said Mino Sancho hasn't been pulling trees I don't know what people are watching he was mediocre last night I'm not joking the first thing I saw when I opened Twitter um during yesterday's game yesterday was someone saying oh look at Jaden Sancho um Jaden Sancho's through to the semi-finals whereas Manchester United are sitting at home or something like that and I was like but Jaden Sancho although he was exiled from the club was still part of Manchester United when we were knocked out of Champions League just remember that he just got a lifeline with being being at being at Dortmund now he got a lifeline to revive his career and good for him I want him to do that like I think we really need to get past the idea that Jaden Sancho doing well is either it's a it's a it is a slap in the face for people that doubted him but it's not a slap in the face for just Manchester United in general just because of the situation at hand it's not like he was at Man United and he was done dirty he was done dirty like he 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 came and you know they paid him 10k over a six month period and then they said to him you know what you're not going to play we don't have any it's not like they sold him dreams or anything this is just an unfortunate situation that has just not worked out it's just not worked out now am i happy for him yes i want to know if you guys will take him back at united because of course the first discussions that i'm seeing are soon like clockwork Jaden sancho has a good game next morning articles oh Jaden Sancho might be open to returning to United. Oh, new United hierarchy might be open to taking Jaden Sancho back. Oh, Jaden Sancho's future depends on the future of Eric Ten Hag. That I know is not a secret. I've been saying that's not a secret. It's not a secret that the future of Jaden Sancho at Manchester United depends on Eric Ten Hag. Now, do you think, and this is a question to everyone in the in in, in the audience, do you think if they sack Ten Hag or or they let's not say sack? If they part ways with Ten Hag at the end of the season and Jadon Sancho returns for the next football season, do you think that that is, in, in a way, taking sides? Or do you think that they're looking at it from an overall perspective where Eric Ten Hag's future might not continue at United, but it doesn't have to mean that Jadon Sancho, his future can't return? Because I don't think it has to be either both get sacked or... Uh, one stays or one leaves I I definitely think that it could definitely be a situation where they might say you know what Eric Ten Hag ain't leaving but a De Zerbi coming in and we're going to talk about De Zerbi or a Graham Potter god forbid but a Graham Potter coming in might be interested in having Jadon Sancho oh you know we've been linked to it and, and his picture is in in the thumbnail in Jeremy Frimpong now. Can I just say, yeah, congratulations to Bayer Leverkusen. I can't, the videos were cracking me up coming out of Bayer Leverkusen, yeah, but Jeremy Frimpong had the fattest smile on his face, yeah? And all I could think was, if that guy comes to United, that smile is gone. That's the, That was the first thought in my head when I saw that United have... Now, Jeremy Frimpong is a name that we've heard as much as we've heard the name of, like, Denzel Dumfries. Now, it's reported that they're looking at him for more of, like, a right wing side I don't see him as a total fullback you know he's been playing you know in that wing back more advanced so it, it makes sense that United could be looking at him as a right wing option by Leverkusen's director I was watching a video an interview that he did um where he was basically saying you know it's expected that we will be selling two or three like we will not dismantle this entire title winning team but two or three people will be leaving um and then with that money we will buy other people so you know I know you know Wurtz is one of them Frimpong maybe 
Bonnie face. I'm just looking at all the names in their team um, to think of who could possibly leave. And obviously, Frimpong is one of them. Now, that guy had the fattest smile on his face, similar to Jadon Sancho before he joined Manchester United. And then that smile disappeared. But I have to be optimistic and think, you know, maybe circumstances have changed at Manchester United right now. But in terms of Jadon Sancho and, you know, just this situation, it's reported that Jason Wilcox... Now, this is from coming from iPaper, so I don't I don't really always believe what they say, but, you know, news is news. Uh, but it's, it's reported that the technical director or the incoming technical director, Jason Wilcox, is understood to be open to giving Sancho another chance. And it's also believed that selling Sancho is still Manchester United's first choice. Now, I don't think it completely depends on Eric Ten Hag's day. And I think there's a there's multiple different factors into the idea of whether Jadon Sancho returns next season. And I think one of the factors, of course, is whether Eric Ten Hag remains as the manager, but also whether, you know, the, the, the structure that Ineos are putting in place, the, the Wilcox, the, the, the Baradas, the, the Ashworths, whether they just want a completely new slate where they don't want any issues from previous uh, management or previous ownerships. They might think, you know what, this is the perfect opportunity for us to have a blank canvas, start from scratch, you know, forget the whole manager discourse, but if there is players that have issues, you know, it might be easy for us to just get rid of them. And I'm talking about the likes of including, you know, Donny van der Beek never got a sniff, excuse me, but never got a real sniff into the team. His his career is not going to be uh, revitalised under Ineos, let's, let's be honest. He is going to be on that transfer list as well. So they might look at Jadon Sancho and think, good talent, you know, should have never spent that much money on him. However, this might be an opportunity for us to have a blank canvas and build what we want to build. Because, you know, a year or two from now, if they decide to keep certain players and, you know, people are just going to be like, oh, or, you know, if Robert De Zerbi comes in, for, if Roberto De Zerbi comes in, yeah, and we've still got the likes of Sancho, we've got Rashford, we've still got Shaw, etc. One or two years from now, when there is a struggle, um, people will be like, oh, previous managers players whereas this will completely allow them to avoid that sort of situation and just have a completely blank was it blank canvas new beginnings completely and Jaden Sancho for me is one of those players who great talent great talent but he's just not been the same since being at United and I think looking at it as a fan not just as as a Manchester United fan but just as a as an overall football fan it's best for him to go and continue his career at Dortmund because when he was playing at Dortmund and he was playing well, similar to right now, he was getting into the England team. Now, right now with the England squad, he's got a bit of competitions. He's got a bit of competition. So maybe coming back to Manchester United might not be ideal for him in the instance of he needs to be playing regular football. He needs to be playing good, consistently good. And he's been at a, in a situation. Oh, shit, sorry. I just slapped my microphone by accident. He's been in a situation at Manchester United where he's not really had the opportunity to play consistently and perform consistently now I've watched I can say I've watched Jadon Sancho probably about four or five times since he's left Dortmund uh, most of them in Champions League um, and I've watched one or two Bundesliga games and he's played well when I've watched him is maybe I'm a good luck charm but he's played well now he needs to continue that to the level of what he was once playing in order to get back into the national team which I think should be a priority as for him as well for his own future and maybe for just the restart or the, the 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 restart right now that Manchester United are going through the refurbishment whatever you want to call it restructure all of that stuff I think it's better for him to not return to Manchester United now I would love that's not me saying I would not want a talent like Jadon Sancho but I can only go off of what we've seen in a Manchester United shirt over the last two three seasons and what we've seen is unfortunately not good and that is also applicable to other players too so I don't want anyone to feel like I'm singling Jadon Sancho out but I've been a I've when United were signing Jadon Sancho, I don't know if you lot remember, but we were actually meant to sign him the year before he actually joined. Um, but they just couldn't agree terms on a price and the, the negotiations, the Ed Woodwardness, all of that was going, it was popping off. I was always thinking, I was always under the impression, what are United doing going for Jadon Sancho? He does not match the criteria of what United wanted on the right hand side. He, he, he wasn't that. He came into United and then said, I like to play on the left-hand side. So whoever the hell scouted him did a crap job. And that also further shows that United's scouting system, as well as their, as well as their negotiation system, 
failed them when they were buying Jaden Sancho. And I also thought Jaden Sancho, I'm not going to lie, guys. At the time, I thought he was too good to join Manchester United. I thought he was in, in a situation where he was p- performing too well and United was a, a, a circus at the time. So I thought, why would he do that? Why? Why He's playing regular in England. He's playing uh, for the England national team. He's playing regular for Borussia Dortmund and, and doing it well. Why would he do that? And then, obviously, a year passed and, and he joined United. And I think, I will be honest, I think his progress or just... I, w- I would say his progress was overshadowed by the return of Cristiano Ronaldo. If you lot remember, we got Jadon Sancho, Ronaldo and Varane in the same summer window. Of course, different uh, different periods of the summer transfer window, but it was within that. And I think the plan, and I think Oli actually touched on it, how the plan changed once Ronaldo came in. Now, I'm not blaming Ronaldo for this entire situation. Can I just say that? I'm not blaming. He, he's got nothing to do with that. But I do think that Ronaldo's arrival changed the managers and the coaching staff's mindset on how they were going to approach the front line. Because now you've 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 got Marcus Rashford. Yeah, you've got Bruno Fernandes. You've got Paul Pogba at the time, right? Then you've just signed a young talent in, in Jadon Sancho. You've just signed a young... You've got Edison Cavani up front. You've got Anthony Martial. And now you've just signed a legend, a club legend, and you've brought him back home. So now there's that additional pressure of, okay... If I'm going to play Cristiano Ronaldo up top, I can't play him and Cavani at the same time. On top of that, where am I going to play Jadon Sancho when he prefers to play on the left, but also Marcus Rashford does? And then we've got Bruno in the 10 and we have Pogba playing behind him with with, with no like actual role because I feel like Pogba's role was always more so defensive than attacking. And when he played attacking more so, that's when you got the best out of him. But that never happened. That never happened. I think there was one season where he played on the left of, of, a, of a midfield three, which was his best statistically season for Manchester United. Um, so I do think, you know, hindsight is a thing in it. Hindsight is a thing. If you look at Jadon Sancho and where United are with him this, this year, I always think what would have happened if Ronaldo never got signed? Because I think Cavani's situation at United would have turned out differently as well. And who knows? Who knows? We might have played f- like 4-4-2 football with Cavani and Martial. We could have done that with a Sancho and a Rashford right and left, Bruno. And I don't know, Bruno Pogba midfield, that might be wishful thinking. That midfield would get overrun. But like I said, I think I think the Jaden Sancho thing was a year too late. I think it was a year too late. But also it makes me think, obviously we know after that Oli interview when he talked about you know signing Cristiano Ronaldo, we know that that was not in the plan that summer. It just, the opportunity came up. Had that not had it had it been in the plan for them to go and sign Ronaldo that summer, I think they would have definitely tried to get that Jaden Sancho deal done a year earlier. But because they didn't, and then that summer was just a whirlwind, a chaotic summer, leading to what well Oli got sacked like what four months after that? Three months after that, he got sacked. So he never really even got am I right to say that? Yeah, Oli did get sacked about three months or so after he got sacked. When was it? I want to say four months after the transfer window. So it, I think, uh, like I said, hindsight is a thing in it. But a lot of things could have been different if United didn't approach that summer the way that they did. Um, big up to everyone. Let me see what the chat is saying. Sorry, guys. I just went on a rant for like 15 minutes. Uh, big up to Naz says, the way people talk about Sancho is weird. If you look online, he needs to leave his own good. His bad games get exaggerated, uh, but United fans cover for our players' thinkers. He needs to go for good. Is it? You know what's funny? It's like, I, I realise with the fan base, it's it's point scoring. It's always point scoring. It's he has a bad game, and the Eric Ten Hag uh, fans and 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 those who always just undermined like players will be like, oh look, he, look at him, look at him. He has a good game, and the Sancho fans or people that felt like he was done wrong will come out of the woodwork. Like there's no winning. There's there, there is never it, any side of a performance whether it's bad or good, someone wins in the fan base. And that's why it's always unbearable for me when Dortmund play. I hate I hate going online when Dortmund play because I just know the discourse that I'm going to see and the conversations I'm going to see is going to... Like today, flipping, I don't know, like Adiemi could score a hat trick, yeah? Jaden Sancho will be the topic of discussion after that. Jaden Sancho will be the topic of discussion. Of, and, and I get it, it's because he's a Manchester United player. Um, I, I, I understand that. But sometimes I feel like... People look for the negativity too much to score point, and then people look at the positivity too much to score point. People don't look at the positives because they're happy for the player. And and maybe this is applicable to, to Sancho. I feel like sometimes people might not look at the positives. Um, they look at the positives to point score. 
not because they're generally happy for the player and they want him to succeed, but more so to prove their agenda and vice versa with the negative uh, opinions, they, the negative performances. They will use that to point score. And it's, it's, it's annoying. It's annoying. Big up to Star Lord in the chat. I hope you're doing well. Big up to Riri as well. Um, you lot are laughing about the Sancho thing. Um, big up to everyone in the chat. Be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. Um, big up to Matt says, we chased him for ages, then completely changed tax the, the second we signed him. Then after the shit show of Ronaldo and Ragnick, we had Eric come in and buy his own right winger. That's why I say it's just it's just chaos. There's no structure. And it's also, it, it just, I think, it, it makes me double down on the, on the on the notion that United's recruitment is a mess because, I'm sorry, how do you scout Jadon Sancho for that long? for a right wing position, for him to come to United and say, I like to play on the left wing. I want to play on the left. Clearly, you weren't scouting him properly. Clearly, you were not scouting him well enough to an extent where you don't even know what his preferred position is. Bear in mind, this is the same team that told us they, they what, what was it? They scouted how many? 800 and something left back, right backs before they drew to the conclusion of signing Aaron wan -Bissaka. Now, I'm not criticising Aaron wan -Bissaka, but how do, you, how do you scout 800 and something right backs and then... Aaron wan who is the most one-dimensional right-back, is what you walk away with. Shout out to Aaron wan because I think defensively he's good, um, but he's got his liabilities. He's got his liabilities. And that's why I say this is more reflecting this Jadon Sancho situation. When it's all said and done, guys, and this summer, if he, get, he gets sold, this is all reflecting on the crap that United have been running with for the last couple of years or the last number of years. This is this is just further proof because how do you sign uh, at the time an English, what's it called? I want to say I don't want to say he was a he was he was he was an English. Yeah, he was an English star boy. He was a he was a wonder kid. He was a wonder kid. Now I watched a good video. Shout out to Umir. If you guys know Umir, Umir, I think his name's Umir, um, on Twitter. He's a he's a City fan, and he did a YouTube video on, I think it was I can't remember who it was, but it's on Jaden Sancho, Phil Foden, and another City player from the academy, and it was basically talking about where is the Manchester City Golden Academy generation, and he touches on you know why City parted ways with. Sancho, but they kept the likes of uh, Foden. It, it was a very good video. I recommend you lot check it out um, if you ever get a chance. Now, before we wrap up this Sancho topic, because we've been on it for a hot minute, and no doubt we'll probably revisit this at some point during the summer. Um, yes or no? Sancho stays in the summer or Sa Sancho gets sold permanently? Um, let me know. Let me know in the comments before we move on to possibly the most annoying topic that I just... Please, not Graham Potter. Well, like, please, I can't do it. I can't. I really can't. I can't have the, the idea of Graham Potter at Manchester United is absolutely traumatic. Imagine, imagine, guys, I'm meant to go on holiday in the summer, yeah? I'm meant to go on summer. I'm meant to go on holiday in the summer. Imagine I'm somewhere on holiday, five hours, six hours behind or ahead of the UK time, and I wake up in the night just to see... United have agreed terms with Graham Parr. The thought of that, the thought of it is, 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 is not, it's is not, it's not. Um, everyone's saying sell. Okay, well, Sa Sancho gets sold. That's, I, I guess, I guess that is possibly, the, probably the more likely, I think this it's the more likely outcome. Um, I think that's the that's the more likely outcome. Um, but like I said, onto the topic of what is I think I, th I saw this news yesterday, and I didn't really think much of it. I didn't think much of it. Um, but it's reported that R Roberto De Zerbi is the preferred candidate for Manchester United. Um, now I'm not surprised because I remember talks of when Pep was meant to leave City uh, before he signed his extension. When Pep was meant to leave. Um, De Zerbi was kind of penned to be his replacement because City liked him, the structure liked him, Umar Barada liked him. They saw him as someone that could take over from Pep Guardiola. Now, that is not me saying if City want him, United should want him. But I think it says more that he has a structure or can apply a structure to the expectations of a manager such as like Pep Guardiola can. And what I say by that, me and Marcel have this debate all the time, if you lot see it on the, on the channel. Um, who's, who's linking us with Potter? Is it Ineos? It's reports that Ineos are 
fans of him. Every a lot of outlets have been reporting it. I think the most recent one was Rich Faye was the most re recent um person to report it. But I saw this yesterday reported by someone on Twitter called Academy Scoop, who basically tweets about Academy stuff, but has always been ten out of ten. Now, I don't think they've missed. So shout out to shout out to that person. Um, and they were saying that it's like sources close to the situation is attracted to the idea of. Uh, De Zerbi, um likes the idea of him as a coach um, to implement a style. Um, and the two front runners right now is Roberto De Zerbi and Graham Potter. Now, one thing is, is that if they if they go for De Zerbi, it's going to cost money, just like it's cost money for them to get Umar Barada, just like it's, no, sorry, just like it costs money to, for them to get Dan Ashworth, just like it's cost, it's costing them money maybe to get Wilcox, just, just like it's costing them money to fix the um restructure just just like is that it's going to cost them money to get roberta de Zerbi because you have to these you, you, there's a compensation cost around 15 million and then on top of that they have to part ways with eric ten Hag, which reportedly will cost um about 8 million so in total it will cost them about 20 something million to part ways with eric ten Hag. And get the Zerbi. Now, I know people are going to say, well, I, I know this is the first argument that I will see people say about this is, oh, we should spend that 20 something million on, on transfers. But in order to, sorry, restructure, you have to spend. You have to spend. Now, whether or not, whether or not Graham Potter comes in. I think if Graham Potter comes in, that's that's a free hit for them. He's he's unemployed right now. He's chilling and he, he got a 20 million payout from Chelsea. Of course, he's if I got a 20 million payout, I would never work a day in my life again. I wouldn't, I would not do that. So of course, Graham Potter has been unemployed since he lost his job uh, with Chelsea over a year ago, I think it is now. Um, so it would cost them less money to go for Graham Potter. Now, from what I don't think Graham Potter and De Zerbi are similar, but one thing I do think they are similar in, and I've said it before, is implementing a structure, a playing style. I think the reason why Graham Potter didn't work at Chelsea, I'll be honest, I think he didn't work at Chelsea because Chelsea itself is a shit show. You know, they've got too many, they, they've got too many circles that they're trying to fit into square pegs, whatever that saying is. They have too many random players that they've brought, a bunch of random youngsters, some of them with barely any experience. I think Graham Potter just walked into an unfortunate situation at Chelsea. I mean, you, you see a whole, what, two managers on, they had Frank Lampard as a temp and then as an interim or caretaker, and then they brought in Poch and even Poch is struggling. I don't think it was solely on Graham Potter. I don't think it was solely on Graham Potter. So he obviously struggled to implement something with those players. Now, Manchester United might not be the similar case, but I think from all the managers that United seems that Ineos are fans of and they seem to be interested in, I'm talking about the Zerbies, I'm talking about the Potters, I'm talking about the, you know, the Amaroms, he, he's probably going to Liverpool anyway. Jabi Alonso, again, staying up by Leverkusen, but there was talk about, you know, him being on a potential long list of managers that United are looking at. I think Ineos' stance is very clear when it comes to the kind of manager they want. They want a manager that will implement football structure, a football style, and do it to an identifiable level. To an identifiable level. Um, I think, you know... Out of the two, I know everyone, by the way, I know who everyone is going to say De Zerbi. I know everyone's going to say De Zerbi. Um, but then I'm on the I'm on the fence where, and this is where you lot could possibly call me out. I don't know. I'm on the fence where I just want to win. Like, just bring me a manager that wins. Bring me an Ancelotti. Bring me, bring me a proven manager that's won at the highest level. Obviously, Ancelotti is wishful thinking, but I'm saying a manager like that. Now, this is where the term, I don't want to say it, but it's a process. I have to accept that if United bring in a manager this summer, it's going to be a process. We are not going to win the Premier League next year. If United bring in the Zerbi, if they bring in Potter, whoever they bring in this summer, we are not winning the Premier League next year. And I think we would just have to accept that. Nagelsmann, I don't think Nagelsmann was ever... I don't think I don't think Nagelsmann was ever a shout. It was reported that he was, had interest from the Premier League, but I think he just always wanted to like. I don't understand Nagelsmann personally because how do you get sacked by Bayern Munich? Yeah, it's like it's basically like yeah, if you're in a relationship and you get dumped, 
and then the person who dumps you dates another person but realizes that person isn't you so then they come back to you and you take them back why would you do that it's reported that he might become he's, he's most likely to become a Dubai Munich manager after the Euros um, and he's most likely going to come in and, and replace Tommy T but again another manager that I personally would have won is Tommy T because I went to the Bayern Munich game last week yeah Bayern Munich versus Arsenal shout out to my PlayStation family for taking me to it I went to that game and the whole time I thought this is criminal Eric Dyer. Eric flipping Dyer is starting in a Champions League game as a centre back. It's absolutely disrespectful to the likes of Kim Min Jae, even Upamakano, who has he's got a bit of you know IQ missing sometimes in his brain, but he is he is way better than Eric Dyer. He is way better. And I thought this is all this is all Tommy T. This is all Tommy T. The way that they were playing against Arsenal, I thought personally that you know Arsenal should have won the game. Um, and it'll be an interesting game today, but I thought Arsenal should have won the game. Um, but I do think like there wasn't, you know, really much to show in terms of personally, in my opinion, there wasn't much to show in terms of complete dominance in possession um, and all of that kind of stuff. I know, I think Koala just mentioned it. Um, Nagelsmann fell out with older players because he's a young manager. I know, apparently he fell out with like Muller. And I guess once you fall, fall out with Thomas Muller, excuse me, once you fall out with Thomas Muller at, at, at Bayern, then it's kind of inevitable um that you're gonna get sacked it's like coming to united and i don't know falling out with wayne rooney at, like, like when he was still playing or something like that it's i think that's the kind of situation it is um but i don't think nagelsman was ever really legitly looking at the manchester united job i think i think whoever comes to become man united manager uh maybe in the summer i think it's gonna be someone that's prem got premier league experience I think it's going to be someone who's got Premier League experience. I don't know why, but even from the players that United are reportedly linked to, we're, a lot of the players we're linked to are players that have been linked or have played in the Prem. These are United don't seem to be looking extensively outside of Premier League experience. I'm talking about Dewsbury Hall. I'm talking about Archie Gray. I'm talking about Amadou Anana, every and Branthwaite. Everyone that United have been linked to or are being linked to, guys, open your eyes. These are players who are playing in the Prem or have played in the Prem. And I think maybe, I don't know, it makes me really curious to be like, I, I would love to be on the, a fly on the wall of, you know, one of Ineos' um, meetings when it comes to restructuring um, and all of that kind of stuff. I, I, I would love to be a fly on that wall, but that's not. I don't know. It's just, are you lot curious as well? Am I the only one that's really curious? Because when I looked at, today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of the reports of who United are, are linked to. Ooh, Ahmad did an interview with um, MUTV. No, no way. They got him. They got him doing media duty when they're not even playing him. That is mad. That is mad. His interview is probably longer than the amount of minutes that he's played in total this season. Justice for Ahmad Diallo. We're actually going to go through it. You know, that's why I love Twitter because people post the quotes. Uh, big up to Mr. K. Been a member for a month. Big up says, Mina, I will go for Unai Emery. And why can't we challenge next season? Arsenal finished fifth and challenge the following season. I think Arsenal were... When Arsenal challenged last year, that was how many years into Arteta's process? I hate that term so much. But that was how many years into Arteta's process? That was a couple of years into it. That's why I'm saying if a manager, a new manager comes in next season, then the process starts. Oh, I hate that word, but the process starts from number like it starts from one again. It starts from one again. Would you guys take Unai Emery? Are you lot on whatever, whatever Mr K is on? Um, because I think Unai Emery is an interesting one. I think he's he. I look at Unai Emery and I think sometimes um, some players. Are, uh, sorry, some managers are better fitted to the mid table teams. You know the teams that are in and around the top teams, but they're not really there. I'm talking about in Spain. Like, look look at Unai Emery's track record. Villarreal, he was doing good. Arsenal, he weren't really doing good. Aston Villa, he's doing good. I think, and I'm not saying there's less pressure, but I'm saying, like, maybe the de demand is less and also the patience is more. I think, I think the patience is more in terms of people will be more patient with you to implement your football structure. I've seen with Unai Emery... He's got players that he wanted and then he had players that he inherited and he created a system that would allow all of them to kind of play well enough in that. Ollie Watkins, yeah, Ollie Watkins is obviously having a good season, but he was the first player to hit double-digit goals assists in the league. 
that was back in like I think January or February. He he was the first, and no one was talking about it. I saw Liverpool fans talking about the fact that Darwin Nunes had double digit goals and assists in all competitions, but Ollie Watkins was the first player to do that in the league. He's Unai Emery has clearly built a system that can get the best out of his players as well as bring in the players that he wants. You know, Aston Villa brought in who, who did they bring? They brought in like the likes of Pal Torres, they brought in Tielemans, he, he already had like a Baba Kaur Kamara, obviously Oli Watkins, they brought in Diaby, already had Leon Bailey. So he brought in players to I wouldn't say match the quality of the players that were already there, but to lift the quality of players that were already there. So that way everybody is now on a, a bit of a higher quality level and he can implement the playing style and, and the way that, you know, and 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 with our Aston Villa, can I say, and it's similar to Spurs, there's games where it does not work. Their high line that doesn't work, it gets, it, it, it gets bypassed. And I've seen Villa hold beatings this season, but the demand, I think, and the criticism is not as high as if you're at a team like Arsenal, if you're at a team like United, etc. So I think Diogo Carlos as well, exactly, another player that he brought in. So I think, with Unai Emery at Aston Villa, I think that's the perfect. I'm not saying he can't coach a big team, and maybe this is, maybe this is where Eric Ten Hag fits. Maybe this is Eric. Maybe Eric Ten Hag fits in this bracket. You know, like I think Unai Emery could go to Ajax and do a good job. I saw someone yesterday. Uh, when was it on the full view? I can't remember when was the full view on Monday. I saw someone on the full view in the chat saying, "Oh, look, Ajax has gone to craps." since since Eric Ten Hag left. You can't tell me that Ajax is crap now because Ten Hag left. They are crap because maybe the structure above him has fell apart and they sold every Tom, Dick and Harry that was in their team and then they brought in the most random players. So maybe that's why Ajax had fell apart. But I do think that maybe, you know, the likes of Unai Emery is flourishing at a Villa, you know, flourished at Villarreal because the, 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 the criticism is not as high and... You're not under a, a magne magnifying glass when you're at the like when you're coaching a team like Arsenal, City, United, Ars uh, um, Liverpool, um, Chelsea to an extent. I feel like that that clout has kind of disappeared for Chelsea. It's still there with Pochettino, but you know if if Ten Hag was doing what Poch has been doing this season, yeah, I think it would be even worse than what it is right now. Even though I'm saying this, and Chelsea's only a couple of points off United. I'm saying this and Chelsea are only a couple of points off. Um, so it'll be very interesting. But you guys know what it is, man. Let me let me share my screen. Um, actually, it's not even worth sharing my screen because these quotes ain't really much. This is, uh, Ahmad done a, um, a pre, I want to say a pre-Coventry interview. Pre-Coventry interview. The questions are pretty basic, but he's talking about the Coventry game. He's talking about the rest of the season. And he, shout out to my guy, Ahmad, didn't it? Because he just sounds like he's, he's he's media trained. He sounds like he's um, media trained. And of course, he's played against Coventry because he was in Sunderland last season. He was in the championship. So he came up against Coventry once or twice. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see if he even gets um, any involvement um, in, in, in the team. In terms of, just the transfer window in general. Is there any players do you guys think that United will walk away with? Because like I said, it seems like United are interested in a lot of Prem young players. A lot of young Prem players or ex-Prem players in the likes of, you know, maybe a player from Leeds or, or Leicester, etc. I know from one thing I've gathered, United are looking for a midfielder. Jao Neves is not going to happen, guys. Let that go. I do not see Ineos coming in and spending 120 immediately on a midfielder in Portugal. I don't see it. No, whether or not he's a good player and whether or not he's worth the price tag is a obviously a completely different story. But I just don't see if Ineos are going to walk the walk that they're talking. I don't see them coming in and spending 100 million. I see them coming in and spending 30 here, 40 here on talented young players um, that have experience. And, and that's why I think the Branthwaite deal is not likely. I don't see Branthwaite joining Manchester United unless it's a big pay cut. Like I'm talking about a big uh, wage, uh, not wage, sorry, a big transfer fee cut, i.e., you know, Everton reportedly looking at 70, 80, up to 90. And I don't think United will pass 60. Take Enketia and give us Rashford. What happened last year? Last year, all I was hearing, your defence is in trouble, Enketia's in the room. And now, Arsenal are waiting to offload him in a heartbeat. 
What happened? Gabriel Jesus, he did he did get a goal involvement last week. I think he did get a goal involvement last week, so I, I can't be I can't be too loud on him. But four goals, four goals. Don't let don't let the opponents fool you guys, guys. Yeah, do not let the opponents fool you. They would absolutely take Rashford, a hundred percent. But don't don't let them fool you. I was literally hearing Enketia is better than Rashford last year. That's what we were hearing. If you lot remember, that is what we were hearing. And now, and and <laughs> I would swap Rashford with him. <laughs> That's rude. That's rude. Do you guys still hope have hope? Yeah. Do you guys still have hope for Marcus Rashford? Is this a player that people should sell their stocks? Is this is this a player that people should s sell their stocks or they should look to um, United should look to to, to offload him? Because I've already said it time and time again. I don't see him going anywhere. He the biggest shock to me would be if Marcus Rashford gets sold this summer. That will be a huge shock. That'll be a huge shock. I do not see Ineos coming in and slapping you know, their new structure or whatever, implementing their new, uh, whatever it is you want to call this. And the first thing they do in the summer is sell Bruno or sell Rashford. I don't see it happening. Bruno and Marcus Rashford, I'm sorry that this might not be what a lot of people want to hear, but they will be part of at least another season at the club. They will have involvement for at least one more season. Um, whether or not, whether or not, you know, it's, deserved or whether or not it should be the case I, i'm not too sure i think everyone's got their own opinion i did a keep sell uh bench um I, I did a keep or sell video like a month or two ago and i said to sell rashford and keep bruno from an ffp standpoint point and i and i don't know if you lot realize but every time sir jim ratcliffe does interviews he does talk about ffp and FFP, I know people don't like to talk about it all the time. And I always hear people saying, don't talk about FFP if you're not finance qualified, financially qualified to do so. FFP will play a big part in how Manchester United move in the summer transfer window. Like, inevitably, that will be the case. Wages are always important to offload on the books in terms of a profit and loss perspective. Getting some money back for amortisation is always important when selling a player. Anthony Martial, for example, might be leaving Man United on a free, but Manchester United will be saving money in the future for, you know, the wages that they've offloaded. Same as, you know, the likes of Donny van der Beek, the likes of Brandon Williams. These are just all wages off the book, whether or not United get some money back for them. Raphael Varane, who I have said time and time again, I would keep him over Victor Lindelof. It would actually work out cheaper if... It would work out cheaper for Manchester United from an FFP standpoint if they had given um, Rafael Varane a new contract, say a one-year deal um, with less wages. It would work less for them. That would be less for them than taking Victor Lindelof's wages and his amortisation of his transfer fee for a year. It would it would work out better. It, it would work out better. So from an FFP standpoint and from an ability standpoint, Varane makes sense. But of course... I don't see him staying because I think I think the club's kind of set on letting him go. And losing him on a free, by the way, is a joke. It's a joke. After you spent that much on him, and he's still got he's still got some legs in him. Um, so even if you can't keep him, you could definitely sell him. Um, but I do, yeah, here you go. The champ says it here. Uh keeping Varan doesn't work in the three-year plan. Exactly. I think Ineos might be looking at it this. Uh, this summer, they might look at the players and be like, do you think this would be like, they will look at the players and be like, oh, who do we see here two, three years from now? If you're not here two, three years from now, you're gone. If we don't see you in the plan, in the vision, that might be the case. What's up with the Elise links? Are we keeping Anthony? Anthony's another player whose future is a bit, I don't know, maybe there's people online that have connections to him that know what's happening with him because it's very hit and miss with what 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 we hear about Anthony is one minute you know the other day we're hearing he, he he was sick next minute we're hearing he stormed out because he was found out he was on the bench on the weekend next minute we're hearing that he might be sold next minute we hear that uh, Eric Ten Hag has complete faith in him 
I think personally, if Eric Ten Hag does not stay, yeah, I think Ineos should just get rid of the players that have not worked that the manager brought in. Is that me being a bit harsh? I'm not sure if that's me being a bit harsh, guys. If I'm saying Anthony didn't work, Eric Ten Hag brought him, ship him off. You know, people like Rasmus Hoyland still stand a chance. Um, people like Anana still stand a chance. Mason Mount still stands a chance. Um, but I think it's really only Anthony that we brought. Malassia, I would be like, pff, unfortunately, he's got a difficult injury to, reco to recover from. And I just don't think he's going to be the same player that he was pre-injury. And yeah, it's the, the, the risk to reward was quite low because United brought him for like, what was it, like 20 million, 18 million? It wasn't a lot. And they hijacked the deal. I think it was from Marseille where he was meant to be going. Um, so that is a low risk, low reward. But that's another player you just don't need that's not adding anything to the team. And that's not me saying that they need to be a bit more harsh with the players. But I think, you know, and it's been clear with Umar Brada in terms of two years from now, if it's not working, get got that's what if you you got two years to impact you got two years to influence you got two years to impress then that says a lot um they are a reliable source they're very hit and miss but they're reliable with stuff in germany i think manchester united are still considering signing stuttgart striker ser ser Hugh, i can never pronounce his first name garassi and are ready to pounce this summer this will be an interesting one. This guy missed half of Athpon because he was injured. He started off the season well. And then can I just say, he started off the season well for Stuttgart and then quiet. I ain't heard much about him since January. I think he had an injury problem just before Afcon. So he still went to Afcon with his national country. I can't remember what country it was, but he still went to Afcon with that, um, with his national country. But he, he barely played. He barely played. I don't think, I would love, I would love for United to buy Isaac. Wallahi, that's my dream. That is, if I'm being honest, guys, and no, it's not because I'm East African. It's not because I'm, I'm East African. Yeah, but I would love Isaac at Manchester United. Rasmus Hoyland, hold it. He can, Rasmus Hoyland can be the rotation player. He could be maybe even a two-striker format kind of thing. I, I don't see United, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't see United ever playing two strikers, but... I would love, I would take, I would take Isaac in a heartbeat. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not joking. I would take Isaac. Um, also, what's his name? I can never say his name. Gayakuris at Sporting. I was watching him at Coventry. I'll be honest, guys. I have not watched him a lot at Sporting, but I'm aware of what he's doing at Sporting. I was watching him more at Coventry because I watched championship football. Um, and he is one player. When he was at Coventry, I was like, bro, this guy... I got tweets, guys. I got tweets from a year or two ago of me saying, this guy's a baller. He's What is he doing playing in the championship? Then he went to Sporting. Another player I wouldn't mind United going for. It's just that Sporting are evidently looking for that, that big price tag. They, I think they said 130 for him. And I don't see United paying that. Um, bring me Leon Bailey. <laughs> I would get if I walked if I walked to Aston Villa right now. I'm saying walked as if I could walk there. But if I went to Aston Villa to sign a winger and I walked away with Bailey instead of DRB, guys, slap me in the face, slap me in the face. I like Leon Bailey, but I think Leon Bailey is just working in a system as well for for for. And also, I just don't like the way like when he goes on international duty. I know the J Jamaicans are mad at him half the time for the shit that he's talking uh, about the Jamaican National uh, Federation and and all of that stuff. But I personally, Diaby would, um, Leon Bailey wouldn't be my first choice. And someone said, nah, I want Ivan Tony. Kuala saying, I want Ivan Tony. Naz is saying, um, uh, Ivan Tony is too, ar too arrogant. I feel like Ivan Tony's heart is set. You know, like on uh, Mudrick. Mudrick, Mudrick's heart was set on joining Arsenal. Yeah. The guy was twerking for them on Instagram. He was posting every match day watching it watching Arsenal games. And then Chelsea come in and buy him and are holding him hostage with an eight-year contract at Stamford Bridge. I think that's the case with Ivan Tony. I think Ivan Tony wants to go to Arsenal. And I feel like a lot of Arsenal fans have kind of moved away from the idea of having Ivan Tony. Last year, before his he started serving his ban, I remember a lot of Arsenal fans were impressed with the idea of Ivan Tony and they were more catered to it. Now he's returned. Arsenal 
Arsenal fans has kind of, have kind of like turned turned their nose at him, and, and they're not interested in him. I think Ivan Tony would be good, but I ask a question to you guys: If United buy a striker, what does that mean for Rasmus Hoyland? Are you lot happy with Rasmus Hoyland being the second option? Um, because I think we've seen it. I think we've seen this season. We've seen patches of what Rasmus Hoyland can do, but he is so raw. He he's so raw, and he could definitely. Um, I think he could definitely do use some work, some experience, some learning. So I think United should go for a striker. They should go for a striker. Um, I, I do think Rasmus has potential to be a good striker. I can't lie. I think he has it. But I just don't think there's traits. When I watch people like well-oiled, well-rounded strikers, sorry, like Solanke, like Watkins, like Isaac, like obviously uh, Haaland, etc. When I watch them and I think when they're not scoring, there's other stuff they're doing. When they're not scoring, there's other stuff they're doing. Whereas I feel like Rasmus Hoyland is still learning. He's still learning how to occupy the back line if he's not wrestling them. He would be an amazing extra in Misfits boxing or like WrestleMania or something like that. Because Bro is fighting the defenders 90% of the game. 90% of the game. His all-round game is not complete yet. And we have to kind of accept. I think we need to accept that as a we brought him as a young player. Now, it was Man United's fault in the first place, to spend that much on a player who's not complete yet. They brought the potential. They went off the stats. I don't know if you lot remember, but when we brought him, there was a fat article. I shouldn't say fat, but there was a big article from The Athletic on Harry Kane. Um, it was like a list of players, list of strikers that United were looking at and why they went for Rasmus Hoyland. And a big part of it was the new data analytics department at Manchester United that was developed last year. And they were a big reason as to why United went for him. Eric Ten Hag wanted Harry Kane. He wanted Harry Kane. Now, all I can think is, imagine having a player like Harry Kane or if Rasmus Hoyland had the abilities of things that Harry Kane can do and other strikers in the league can do, which is play back to goal, hold up, drop deep, link up. Imagine all the space that the wingers would have to utilise and to run into. Instead, we have Hoyland doing nothing. It's, 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 it's very unfortunate. Um, and I know a lot of you lot, <laughs> Erasmus must hold bench. Damn, Nick saying not even hold bench. Nick said, get rid of Hoyland. He is not him. Um, One Don says, we need three strikers. Who cares? He needs to fight for his place. Uh, Abe World says, Rasmus is good, but he can hold bench for a while. Isaac will teach him a lot. Isaac has been balling since his Sociedad days, can I just say. He's been balling from his... So He's been balling from even... Shit. I lost... What was the team that he was playing? Was it Malmo that he came from? Because I watch, I keep up with the Swedish league a lot, guys, because there's a lot of people from my ethnic background that play in in the Swedish league. So I keep up with that a lot. It was it was AIK. It was AIK because there was two other people from my ethnic background that play at AIK right now. Um, and he's been balling even from, from them days. Um, Hoyland ain't it, I can't lie Riri says Rasmus needs service but he also might come into the midfield and pick up the ball sometimes, he doesn't, the thing is is like he doesn't do that he doesn't do that and I think that's the most frustrating part because when I watch, again, players, strikers in the Premier League, you know, well-rounded number nines, if they are not scoring they are impacting the game in other ways Solanke scored against us but what did he do well? He caused havoc for the centre-backs and the midfield because he was dropping into positions that Rasmus Hoyland wouldn't as a striker. He was getting players involved, link-up play, back to Cole. And maybe this is where we were spoiled when we had Anthony Martial playing at a high level when Anthony Martial was doing this kind of stuff. Um, Hoyland, at best, is second pecking order striker, plus his continuous back injury he won't see past 27 years old. Hoyland is awful. I'd rather have Nico Jackson. I was having this debate. I was having this debate with my friend who's a Chelsea fan. And my, my friend was saying that, that Nico Jackson is way better than Rasmus Hoyland. And I wasn't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't really buy that. I don't really buy that. Maybe, maybe I'm too, maybe I'm being those kind of fans that is looking at the potential rather than the product in front. This is why if I was ever in a relationship, it would be a toxic one because I'm too busy looking at the potential. I'm not looking at you as a, you could be a bum. I could be in a relationship with you and you, I could be married to you and you could be a bum. Yeah. Or you could be like, you could have no aspirations, but I'm looking at your potential. And that's what I'm doing with Rasmus Hoyland. That is my problem. I'm looking at the potential of what he could be rather than the product he is right now. 
And I think him and Nico Jackson, I, I feel like they're, they're <laughs> Kadeem says I'm better than Jackson. <laughs> I'm better than Jackson. <laughs> Riri says now nah, I watch a lot of Chelsea games and he ain't it. that's the thing when I talk when, when I debate about Jackson um and, and Hoyland I'm just not having it I'm just not having it uh, I like that he doesn't come into midfield it's more negative to the team that they can't find him Rasmus biggest L for me is his bad movement and his runs he makes bad runs I can definitely accept that I can definitely accept that he makes bad runs pyramid scheme ain't having none of this by the way pyramid scheme says Mina please don't make excuses for Derek. <laughs> He can't sign Mount for 70 million and expect to still get Kane. I feel like he signed Mount for 60 million because he knew he wasn't getting Kane. I think I think that was the case. I think he knew he wasn't getting Kane, so so that that was the reason why he went for for Mount. Uh, I think I think by the time he brought Mount, he knew he was going to get um, Rasmus Hoyland. And he wasn't going to get, get Kane. But it's one of them situations where I also can't imagine United spending 60 million back-to-back -back windows on two strikers. But to be honest, guys, we make these excuses for United. But to be up there, you need to spend. Ch uh, Madrid, um, not Madrid, sorry. City won the treble. Went out and spent 80 million on Vardyol. 80, I think it was like 70 million they brought him for. Like, they have... City have had obviously they got unlimited money as well, but they've also got unlimited sponsorships and they also got 115 charges. But every year City have won, they have gone out and spent comfortably in the window or have forced themselves to spend to a high level. Mourinho finished second and we gave him Fred. No disrespect to Fred. I love Fred. You lot know I love Fred. Yeah, no disrespect. But you know, if United are gonna be able to compete, Arsenal got close to a title last year. What did they do? 100 million, Declan Rice. United have to do that. I think I think United will definitely, definitely have to do that. Uh, big up to D uh, with the super chat. I appreciate it. It says, big up to the channel. I said earlier in the chat as well, says, you are the GOAT, but come on, you gunners. Listen, I will... Um, let me see what the poll is saying right now. You lot are saying double watch along? Double watch along it is. Double watch along it is. Uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. But I don't want to hear people complaining about the fact that I'm like 30 seconds behind. Yeah, I don't want to hear the complaints. That's also maybe why I don't have a TV in my studio right now, guys. So when I'm watching, I'm streaming it, um, which I think most people do for their watch alongs. And, and inevitably, they're always like a minute behind. Um, but I also do need to go and run some errands as well. So I actually don't know if I'll be back uh, to do the stream. I'm so shameless. I'm I'm actually so shameless. Uh, big up to Ridwan says the last game of the Prince season is United versus Brighton on the 19th. Imagine we lose to Brighton, ten will get sacked after the game, and we sign the Zerbi straight after a lull. That could happen. That could happen. I do also think I a part of me does feel like by the time that um by the time that United by the time we get to that game, I think Ineos know if Ten Hag is staying or not. I don't, I generally am not buying it. I'm not buying it that, oh, it depends if United have finished in Champions League and it depends on if United do this or the, you know, no. Right, to, as of today, United, no. Ineos, no. Said 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 Dave Brailsford and uh, said Jim Ratcliffe, Umar Barada, Umar Barada, yeah, shout out to my Arab brother. He's probably sitting in his garden smoking shisha. He knows, he knows if Eric Ten Hag is staying. He knows it. He already knows in his, in, in that shiny head of his, mashallah, he knows already it don't depend on um where united finish it don't depend on all of that stuff. it doesn't depend on none of that they already know so by the time we get to brighton game the zerbi might also know in his heart already that you know what my agents already chatting to them and you know i might this might be me sitting on the other side of of of, of the of the bench next year when when they come to the amex stadium when united come next year it might be me on the other side i think It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. Um, but I do also feel like it has to be like, you know, as soon as the season ends, because you guys also keep in mind that if United get to the FA Cup final, United season don't end until what, the first or the second week of, was it the last week of May will be the FA Cup final? And then the week after that is the Champions League final. Not that United is going to be in it, but I'm just for context. The football season will not officially finish until the 2nd of June, right? The actual football season per se, will not finish until 30th of June. So 1st of July is when the new season starts. But by then, United need to have this manager stuff wrapped up. 
they need to have by the time it gets to the, after the FA Cup final, if Eric Ten Hag, do you think? And this this was the debate we were having on the full view the other day. Do you think if Eric Ten Hag wins the FA Cup final, he should stay? This is a similar discourse that's going on around Manchester United women. If you lot follow Manchester United women, uh, there's a similar conversation. They haven't been performing well this season. Um, I think a lot of people want the manager out. You know, there's been players coming out who have left the club that have been saying, you know, they're glad that they're not they're in a positive environment and all of this alluding to certain situations. And now Manchester United women find themselves in an FA Cup final back to back, by the way. This is two years in a row. United have never, Man United women have never won a trophy ever, 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 ever. And now they find themselves in the second final and they knocked out Chelsea and they're playing Spurs, who United are playing actually, funnily enough, on Sunday and beat. We beat Spurs women 4-0 early in the season in the WSL. So the big conversation surrounding that is whether the manager, Mark Skinner, should stay if United win the FA Cup and get his contract. It's different to Eric Ten Hag because his contract actually finishes this season, whereas Eric Ten Hag still has a year. I think Eric Ten Hag, whether he stays, whether he wins or not, I think he's gone. I think for the season that United have had, nothing can... I think a trophy just paints over the cracks. I think it just paints over what the season has actually been. Um, let me see what the chat is saying before I wrap it up. Uh, that guy behind you, Dan Juma, would be a great player. Sean uh, Dyche is a fraud. I don't know why Dan Juma's not getting playing time. And I'm not saying that just because i got a signed shirt behind him. If you look, can't see, the shirt is signed. You know, signature right there. There's a message on it that says two minutes. Shout out to my guy, Dan Juma. Great, lovely person. Interviewed him as well top interview I don't know why he doesn't get playing time I don't know why and and maybe because Sean Dyche has a system and he doesn't really fit into the system I don't I don't think so I don't think and I don't think he fits into the system he was I've heard that he was meant to go to Leon in January um but it, he didn't end up leaving because I think his loan appointment wasn't cancelled his loan at Everton all of that for him to just stay and just not play again Beto goes ahead there's so many players that go ahead of him in the team and I, and I just don't get it Calvin Lewin, I don't know how Calvin Lewin still starts for, for Everton, honestly. To go to Stamford Bridge and hold six, I'm sorry, that is, that's sad. Uh, Minna, don't play with our hearts. Will you do the watch along? I'm a woman of my word. How many people, 44 people voted, 82% said watch along. I will do the watch along. That just means I expect at least 30 something people there. <laughs> I will do it. I just have to go run my errands quick. I need to go pick up a package and come back. But you know what? Because I'm a woman of my word, funnily enough, guys, I've even already done the thumbnail. I, I did the thumbnail today already. Uh, I just need to set the stream up. As soon as I finish this stream, I will set the stream up so that you lot can go and um, like it. You can go turn on your post notifications. I will be live 7.50 p.m. UK time. 7.50 p.m. UK time, 10 minutes before kickoff so that we can talk about the lineups, we can do all of that stuff because I think it's going to be another great day um, of, of Champions League football. For me, winning the FA Cup alone isn't enough. It's just six games or something. What about the 38 Premier League games plus the six Champions League games? That's another one. The six Champions League games no one's talking about. Can I just say, it's funny because Eric Ten Hag, people keep comparing him to Sir Alex Ferguson because Sir Alex Ferguson was in this similar position in, I think it was 1991. Um, current the current Coventry manager was a player at the time, scored the goal for Man United to win the FA Cup. So Alex Ferguson ended up keeping his job, went on to become a legend. People are comparing, can you believe people are comparing that to Eric Ten Hag right now? That is just nuts. History doesn't repeat itself twice, can I just say? And no two managers are the same. No two managers are the same. Let me just say that. Let me just say that. But guys, I gotta wrap it up because if I if I'm gonna do this watch log, I need to go and run my errands, um, have some food. I don't want to be eating on stream. You know, guys, that's also a pet peeve of mine. People who eat on streams, like it's fine eating a little chocolate here. I do it, you know, eating a chocolate here, having some drink here. But people fully eat meals on stream whilst they're doing watch logs. That's crazy. I can't do that. I can't. That's like doing a mukbang. I can't do that. I can't eat in front of a camera. Uh, that's that's too much. But big up to everyone. Be sure to hit the like button, guys. Be sure to subscribe. And like I said, I'll be back in two hours' time. You lot ask for it. We're going to do it. Should I get sushi? I'm such a disgrace. I've eaten on stream. How could I just say that people that eat on... I've literally eaten on stream. I was eating sushi during AFCON on stream. I'm, well, I am a disgrace. I'm a disgrace.
get them. Big up there, bro, man. You lot know what it is. Be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. We'll be back Champions League nights. You lot know what it is, man. We will be back later on, man. I'm out. Peace.